So the uh, little bit about me, my company always wants me to put the slide on here, all the great stuff that we do. And, uh, and you, know, I, you know, we do interesting stuff in the security space, and we have our incident response management system product that's out there. So if you want more information on that, feel free to hit me up. But I like to kind of talk a little bit about my background. This, this presentation is, is really a fusion of, of kind of two worlds in uh, computer forensics and web application security. And, uh, and that's really my background. You know, I, I originally uh, did computer forensics for the Army. Um, so I've, I'm used to doing those sorts of things, you know, at NCASE and those sorts of products, looking at, you know, what happened on a computer system, those sorts of things. And then uh, after, after I left that position, I went on to kind of doing some other things like pen testing and vulnerability assessments and really got interested in web application security. So that's, uh, and so really I've, I'm always kind of looking for ways to kind of put those two worlds together. And I think this presentation really does that in that it's, it's a web application security issue, cross-site request forgeries, but it's also relevant certainly to computer forensics as we'll see. So that's my background. And I guess another administrative thing is just that if you, if you do have questions, feel free to throw up your hand, uh, yell something out if I don't see you. I'm, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Obviously, I'll be available afterwards, as Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, to talk to you guys uh, as well. So feel free to, to interrupt or to ask questions if you have them. And uh, let's move on. So this is our agenda. We have uh, really just want to talk about, you know, uh, let me get out my little laser pointer here. I like to use that as well. The, uh, to talk about, you know, what is a cross-site request forgery and how does it relate to investigations and forensics? And we're going to do some live demos here, assuming that our, our network connection doesn't die on us. And we're also going to talk a little bit about, you know, now that we know what, at that point, we'll know what cross-site request forgeries are, how do they apply to, to what we're doing and how can you look for them or, or rule them out as part of a forensic investigation or any other sort of investigation? So. Scenario that I've got is, is you know, kind of setting this up. It's a, it's a familiar thing for those of you who do computer forensics. They, they like to talk about these sorts of things of kitty porn in the sense of cats as a kind of a euphemism. But I think it's also relevant not just for people that are, you know, law enforcement types, but it's also relevant to any sort of security professionals because I think that a lot of us get brought into investigations of one sort or another, whether it's actually looking at people's computers that maybe were doing some, you know, inappropriate things during, during work hours or those sorts of things, or, you know, perhaps not the computer itself, but looking at proxy logs and firewall logs and, you know, those sorts of things. So I think security people really get brought into all sorts of investigations. So, uh, so that's kind of how I want to set this up. So um, actually, let's, let's just a quick show of hands here as far as like, who, who here actually does uh, computer forensics as far as that you regularly use things like NCASE and those sorts of products? So one, or, one person, so not very many. How many people here are web application security people, either your developers or, or uh, people that you know, manage systems? So that's, that's a good little number. And then how about people that are just general security folks? You, 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 you know, work in a SOC or you work uh, IDS systems, those sorts of things. So a few people there. And obviously not everyone rose their hand, but I'll assume that the rest of you are, are uh, along the same lines. So, uh, so that's, that'll, that helps me a little bit in kind of scoping this as far as what we want to talk about. So in our scenario, you're, you're looking for this uh, cat pornography. And you, you look in, at someone's computer, and you see, well, they've got some Google searches in their web browser cache. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. You've got you know, maybe Flickr searches as well, or you know, many, maybe any other sorts of websites that they've seen them doing things. You see, obviously, all sorts of images in the web cache of, of various things that, uh, that aren't supposed to be there. And, and you see you know, full, in addition to just you know, individual images, you see full web pages in, in either the cache or the browser history, or, or also this could be through your proxy logs, where you've got you know, actual uh, websites that you're interested in. So that's uh, the first phase. And then you go on, and, and either you're looking more in depth at the cache, or perhaps your law enforcement type, you start subpoenaing you know, service providers and that, and you find out that you, know, you look at their Netflix queue, and while obviously there's no nothing you know, illicit that you could find on Netflix. It at least gives you a little bit of interesting uh, insight into what the person is thinking. And I use Netflix because that's one of the examples that we'll show later on as far as a demonstration. And you, you also see some posts to some online forums and that sort of thing. So um, the question at this point is, you know, do we have enough now to say, like, hey, this guy was definitely looking for cat porn? And so uh, let's just do a quick show of hands. Is how many people say yes? Not. Not very many people raise their hand. And how about how many people say no? Not very many people raise their hand either. So I'm guessing a lot of you are, are either not, not, uh, don't want to raise your hand or you're, you're not sure. So the, uh, the, the answer, and, and I guess this is kind of uh, should be obvious since this is what the, the uh, talk is about, is that 
Not necessarily. That, you know, definitely the kind of things that we, we just talked about could have been caused by user activity and the user actually going out to these sites and doing things that he's not supposed to do. But it also could have been a result of, of a, what's known as a cross-site request forgery. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today is what those are and, and how they relate to uh, investigations. So a little bit of background just to, as kind of a caveat here. You know, we're going to talk a lot about cross-site request forgeries as far as you know, how they could be used um, either to kind of frame someone or to make things you know, appear that in uh, a, a user's uh, web browser cache or whatever that, that aren't that weren't uh, the result of user action. But we haven't really seen that at, at Mandiant or at the other places I've worked you know, as, as really something that, uh, that we've actually you know, seen in the wild as far as being exploited. And, and the reason I caveat that is just I want to make sure that we kind of set this up as far as, uh, you know, this is more of a theoretical thing. And, and, and there, there's, but there's, I think, two reasons still to be interested in it. And one, one of those is that it could certainly be happening. So it's something that if you're, if you're doing an investigation, you need to be aware of these sorts of issues because it's possible that maybe the guy really didn't do the bad stuff that you thought he did, and, and maybe he's innocent. And, and you know, if you're an investigator, your, your interest is not in you know, trying to make the person look bad if he, if he isn't. You want to find the truth, you know, that the truth is out there kind of thing. And uh, the other thing is, uh, more importantly, I think, is you could certainly see where the defense is going to raise this. So either in an you know, administrative kind of thing, if someone's getting terminated from your company, or in an actual law enforcement type investigation, that they may want to bring this, the defense may say, well, you know, our client didn't do whatever bad things it is that you thought they did. It was a result of one of these cross-site request forgeries. So I think that investigators need to be aware of these so that they can, uh, they can uh, make sure that they look for that during their initial investigation and don't kind of get caught later on, say, you know, on the stand having to say, well, I never really considered that aspect. And uh, I think that's important. And the other thing is that, you know, we're talking about cross-site request forgeries. That, you know, those of you who aren't investigators and, and are actually web application types, you know, it's good to talk a little bit about these uh, issues just so that hopefully if you're building applications or have any influence on people who are building applications, they'll at least prevent uh, cross-site request forgeries in them that'll make everyone's lives a little bit easier. So I'm going to take a quick drink, drink of water. I apologize, I'm a little bit sick, so hopefully uh, I don't go into a coughing fit in the middle here or anything. So any questions at this point? Sure. Right. Yeah, that's certainly something that comes up in defense a lot. The, the, the comment was, is there you know, proxies or other things running on the machine that maybe caused uh, the, the behavior to happen? And, and I think uh, that's similar to what comes up in defense a lot of, of malware. It's like, well, there's some sort of Trojan on my machine that was causing me to do these bad things or causing my computer to do these bad things that I had nothing to do with. And uh, I think it's a similar issue, and you, you may see some of the same sorts of things in either of those cases, because you may actually see you know, some of the fragments of image files and that sort of thing. Uh, in either of those cases, if it's a proxy or some sort of malware. But, uh, okay, so what is a cross-site request forgery? So I hope, uh, hope this isn't too basic. If, if you guys know it, hopefully we'll run through it pretty quickly. Um, in a name, uh, just to be aware, that cross-site request forgery is the most standard name for this type of issue, but there's actually several other names. Some people like to abbreviate it, XSRF, similar to cross-site scripting. Um, some people use reference here instead of request, but still abbreviate it CSRF. Some people just say CSRF as kind of, you know, pronouncing CSRF. So uh, just be aware, if you've heard of any of those other things, it's the same, uh, the same issue, cross-site request forgery. And also, if you're, if you're familiar with cross-site scripting, it's best just to forget about cross-site scripting for the time being, because it's, it's really a, a different issue with different type of protection mechanisms that, that need to be uh, implemented. So don't try to relate it to cross-site scripting. It's really, uh, it's really separate. So the gist of what it is, and, and I'll do a quick explanation here, and then we have a picture on the next slide that'll make it a lot easier. But the, the basic idea is that the, the HTTP protocol and the way HTML works is that if I create a web page, I can include um, images and, and uh, other sorts of content from, from anywhere else on the internet. So I don't have to just you know, include all of my HTML and JavaScript and, and images and everything on one server. I can have a whole bunch of servers that I pull stuff from all across the internet. And that's really what makes CSRF happen, is that uh, you've got the ability to pull in data. So one web page can pull in um, parts from all sorts of other places. And when those parts are pulled by your web browser, 
be a, like any other HTTP transaction, your cookies are going to be sent along with those requests to, to third-party servers. So if, uh, and that's if you have an established session. So um, that's really what causes a CSRF. And, uh, and regardless of you, if you have a, ses a session, which is what we'll see later, is that, you know, uh, that images and, and other sorts of content from these third-party sites can appear in your web browser cache, your history, those sorts of things. So, uh, and, and also just, uh, we're going to talk a lot about HTTP GETs as far as examples, but they can occur on either an HTTP GET or a POST, so just be aware that um, it's just a little bit easier to talk about GETs and, and it's easier to exploit, but not by much. So this is how a CSRF happens. So you've got three parties when you start off. You've got a you know, user who's, who's a, a victim, if you want to call him that. He's uh, just surfing the web. You've got a target web application that is vulnerable to CSRF. And then you've got the attacker's website. So the attacker has some sort of hosting mechanism that he's able to host content. And it could not be a full website. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. So you start off that the user logs on to this target web application. So he logs on, and when he sends his username and password, and what he gets back is a cookie. So he gets a, a session cookies, as almost all applications use as far as maintaining state. And uh, once he's got his cookie, then he can do whatever he wants on this application. So if it's a web forum, he could go in there and start you know, reading posts. He could make some posts, um, those sorts of things. And uh, the key now is that you know, he still has this established session. So he doesn't log out of the application. And you know, maybe he just browses away or opens up a new browser tab and ends up uh, going to another site. So the attacker's website or whatever's hosting the attacker's content, you know, he, the user makes a request there. And what comes back as a response is uh, some sort of HTML that causes a, uh, that basically includes a, uh, uh, element from the target web application. So in this case, it's an inline frame, and you see the source here is this target web application, and there's parameters here that, uh, that show, you know, basically just the, uh, what, the content that's gonna be forced by the user. Because what happens then is that the user's browser sees this and says, oh, happily, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this thing that you told me to grab, and because I have an established session, I'm gonna go ahead and send my cookies to that site as well. So if you think of this as a web forum, this could be a uh, URL that's gonna cause like a forum post to happen. And so now this user is gonna have uh, this, po this forum uh, post made on the web forum, and obviously is not aware of it because this inline frame you'll see is, is set at you know, zero pixels uh, in size. So it's basically, it doesn't show up in his web browser. All he sees the victim is just the, uh, the regular attacker's website. So that's a simple CSRF. Um, any questions at this point? Does this make sense to everyone as far as why, uh, how this works and, and why it works? Okay, good. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of clarification here. Uh, so, you know, there's a, the, the example we just showed used an iframe and you can also use image tags to do CSRF. Uh, and the, the difference is that a, an image tag is just gonna basically cause one request to go to the server. And then uh, this type of image tag actually would, would end up showing like a broken link basically because it's gonna, you're gonna make a request to the target and then you're, what you're gonna get back is not an actual image. So you'll end up with a broken image link in your browser. But if you set this to zero pixels in size, then it would just wouldn't show up. Um, if you do an iframe, it's a, a little bit more interesting because an iframe then, even though it's hidden, you're still gonna load all the other elements that are part of the, the page. So uh, JavaScript, images, those sorts of things are all gonna get loaded. And sometimes uh, inline frames will show up in your history as well. So that's kind of the two, two ways we normally talk about it. But there's a whole bunch of other ways that you can actually force that GET request. And, and uh, you know, scripts, uh, just regular links that you want people to click on. Uh, the uh, actual, within JavaScript, you can have the links as well, background images, all this kind of stuff. So there's all sorts of ways that the GET request can be forced with HTML. So just keep that in mind. And also, I mentioned earlier that, you know, the attacker has to have somewhere that he's hosting his uh, CSRF, uh, kind of the malicious uh, thing that he wants to, to throw out. But uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full web page. So he could post the content on like a wiki or even just in an, send it in an HTML email, those sorts of things to the, uh, to the user. So there's lots of different sites that can be used to, uh, to do it. And it's basically anything that, that allows you to host anything like HTML. If it's just plain text, then, then you, it's, it's really not gonna be the case. But if it's anything that allows you to link to graphics or link to other, uh, other you know, pieces of HTML like kind of things, then, uh, then that should be vulnerable. And you could also have the, you could actually have a uh, kind of a same site request for you where you could host it on the same site if you wanted to. Um, it's just a, 
And that's, that's actually a good thing, because one, one of the things you'll notice in, uh, in our picture here is that you know, the, the CSRF relies on the fact that the user has an established session with this target web application. So if, you, if, you're, if you're on the same site, then you're, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed that the person's going to have an established session with that application, and that uh, makes it a little bit easier for, uh, for the attacker. So go back to here. Um, and we talk about cookies, but the, there's other types of, uh, of session identifiers that are vulnerable to CSRF as well. Basically, your HTTP integrated authentication, so basic, digest, NTLM, uh, those sorts of things. And uh, what's not vulnerable to CSRF is if you've got URL parameters or query parameters that, uh, that are using, uh, that your session identifier is, is basically stored there. Uh, there's other issues with that, but that's uh, something we won't get into. So, and the other thing that's just kind of interesting since we're talking about CSRFs is that, you know, the reality of it is, and we'll see in the next picture, is that the, uh, the attacker doesn't need to actually be able to access the target of the CSRF. So the, all the traffic comes from the victim. So you could, uh, you could actually have an intranet, intranet application that's not available to the outside, but is still vulnerable to CSRF through your users. And, uh, and intranet applications are particularly vulnerable to CSRF because they're usually not nearly as well secured as, as actually internet applications. A lot of times they use built-in authentication that's you know, Windows integrated authentication. So you're not going to even have to log on. It's just going to automatically happen in the background. So in the picture here is that you know, basically you've got a user and the attacker's got his content out here outside the firewall and you've got your target web app here. And so the uh, user just basically makes a request. The response comes back and then obviously the, uh, the forced request happens entirely within your intranet. The only, the only key here is obviously the attacker is going to have to have some sort of intide knowledge because he's got to know what URL that you want to force the request to. Um, so, so that's the one reason that you don't see this exploited as often, but it's just something interesting to keep in mind if you're, uh, if you're looking at these sorts of issues that don't necessarily just rule out an application because it's on, on an intranet. So during investigations, we're concerned with CSRF for two reasons. And one of the reasons that I just... Uh, we've really been talking about is kind of CSRF in the typical web application security perspective of that a request are being forced on a server that's causing some sort of state change on the server that, you know, you're, you're posting a, something to a web forum or you're, you're maybe deleting an email or sending an email or any of those sorts of things. There's a state change happening on the server. And that's, a, you know, that's kind of the normal uh, reason that uh, web application security folks are interested in CSRF. And, and those can be prevented, you know, that there's, there's mechanisms you can put in place. We'll talk later about how you detect and and, uh, and, and actually prevent CSRF in, a, in the web application security sense. But we're also interested in, in investigations in that the CSRF may not actually be targeting an application, but may just be targeting the, ve the web browser or the actual traffic coming from a client. So that, uh, and because sites are being viewed without the user's knowledge, stuff's happening in the background. So if you're monitoring proxy logs, you're going to see requests going out from this user for, for various things that maybe he's not supposed to be going to. And obviously, if you look at his cache, his history, you're going to see those things as well, potentially. So that's really the two reasons. So we're, you know, I, I, it's important to keep those two clear in the sense of, you know, one type can be prevented, and we'll talk about how to prevent that uh, later on, assuming we have time. And uh, the other type really can't. You know, this, this sort of activity where you're only aiming to affect what happens on the, the victim's web browser, you really can't prevent. So what you really have to do is, if you're an investigation, you need to, to look into that to see if you can... Uh, at least detect it or, or rule it out during uh, when you see something bad happening. Okay, so let's do a couple case studies and demos here. Um, and uh, so the first one we're going to talk about is Netflix. Uh, this is why Netflix was in my scenario earlier. Is that you know uh, in September of 2006, uh, security researcher Dave Ferguson noticed some uh, a lot of a lot of problems with Netflix as far as CSRF. There was uh, just all over their site they had CSRF vulnerabilities, and we'll uh, illustrate one of those in a second. But the uh, um, so what the, those vulnerabilities allowed you to do was uh, to uh, basically add uh, movies to people's queues, manipulate the queue as far as move things around in your Netflix queue. I assume you guys are familiar with Netflix. It's you know, online video rentals. Um, and it also um, allowed you to do some pretty bad stuff with the people's account information because you could uh, actually go and uh, change the address that movies would be mailed to. You could potentially delete accounts, all sorts of you know, stuff on, on the account side as well. So, um, 
So if you look at uh, Netflix today, you'll see that basically when there's a, a link that basically says, you know, you're looking at a movie that you're interested in, looking at the reviews or whatever, there's a link that says basically, do you want to add this to your queue? And this is exactly what the link looks like. It's basically Netflix.com, add the queue, and then it's just a, an ID for the movie. So it's just a, a number there. And obviously, that's the same for all users. Um, like I said, there were, there were all sorts of other issues that have been fixed by Netflix, but, but this sort of issue has not been. So they, they have fixed the account management stuff where you can't go and change people's mailing addresses anymore, but they haven't fixed these uh, issues on, the, uh, on adding movies to the queue. Um, so this is uh, maybe just the same idea. So it's basically that's what he, uh, he just basically said, well, you just make a little HTML and just have an image source, uh, image tag that sources to that same URL that we just saw on the previous page. And then if you wanted to actually move it around on the queue, you just have to wait a little bit because you have to make sure that the movie's added to the queue. And then you can just go ahead and move it right to the top if you wanted to. And it, it's interesting that the, this, this vulnerability is still there because you think it's, well, it's more of kind of a something that's uh, maybe not as exciting in the sense of, well, you know, how, how, how interesting is it as an attacker to go in there and just you know, add a bunch of movies to people's queues? But you could see that you know, maybe this could be a, a revenue generator if you perhaps released a small independent film and now it's like you want to make a whole bunch of people add it to their Netflix queue, so Netflix is going to have to go buy a bunch of copies of your movie in order to satisfy the demand. So there are definitely a, a scenarios where you could see that, the, that this would be useful for an attacker. And so as of today, or at least yesterday, and hopefully still today, the, uh, this issue still hasn't been resolved. So um, it's, it's only been 17 months, though. So Netflix has, uh, has had, had a little bit of time to, to fix this. And it just hasn't, I guess, bubbled up to the top of their priorities yet. And uh, so basically, you just do one of these image sources, and you'll be able to see the, uh, see the queue. So let's go ahead and, and try this here. Hopefully, uh, make sure I've got room here to uh, move my mouse. So I have uh, my Internet Explorer window, and if I can pull it to the right side. OK, so here's my Netflix queue, which is entirely too big to fit on the screen. So let me uh, go ahead and shrink that down as well. And on my queue, you can see there's all sorts of movies that my wife likes. But uh, the key here is that there's 167 movies. And uh, let's go ahead and refresh just to make sure that you know I'm not lying to you, that there's still 167 movies on the queue, I hope. And that, uh, yeah, our internet connection is still good. OK, so, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and open up a new browser window. So I've got my established session with Netflix. And I'll just go ahead and kill this. And then I will hopefully pick up the right thing here, Netflix. One of those should say Netflix CSRF or something like that. Uh, I think it's up, up one. OK, yeah, then don't want don't to do the next demo yet. OK, so this is I'm just loading up a web page from, from my own web server. And you'll see that, uh, you know, Obviously, you know, the normal attackers wouldn't have this nice text here telling you what's going on. But you can see that there's actually some stuff happening in the background as well, although some of it's related to the ads that, that GoDaddy puts on my page. But the uh, result should be, if we go here and click Refresh, we should be up to 168 movies if I haven't done anything wrong. Yep, there we go. So there's now an extra movie on my queue. And once it finishes loading, I can show you what it is. Just uh, Fun. So scroll down, and you'll see here everyone's favorite movie. If I can get it. Again, the network's kind of slow here, so you'll have to apologize for that. But come on. There it is. Hackers. So, so that's a, a simple cross-site request forgery, just as an example. And the other thing that's interesting is that if you go to sign out, which I'm definitely going to do now because I don't want you guys to, to steal my cookies and start messing with my Netflix queue even more, is that uh, when you sign out of Netflix, it gives you this little nasty gram that basically says, well, you really shouldn't have signed out because you, know, you, you only have to do that if you're on a shared computer. So you know, we'll do it for you this time, but, but in the future, don't sign out, please. Which is, which is really funny that the fact that they've had this cross-site request forger issue for so long and that they actually discourage their users from logging out of their application. So, I, uh, I find that definitely uh, kind of ironic. And uh, so let's go back into our PowerPoint, and then we will uh, have a couple more slides, and then we'll have another a quick demo. OK, come on, start up. There we go. OK, and this is just uh, the, the actual picture here that shows what, uh, what we saw on the little logout screen. 
So the other thing that's, uh, that's definitely uh, interesting in the sense of cross-site archives forgeries is search engines. You know, search engines use, you know, get requests to do searches, and normally they should because, you know, the, a, a, search, a search request shouldn't be causing some sort of state change in an application. It should just be kind of a, an app, uh, a, something that, you know, causes data to be fed back to the user, but it's not causing a state change, which is why, you know, what, what get requests are for. But this is uh, interesting in that it's, it, it is interesting for computer forensics because it causes some, some issues with your browser and, and the pet traffic that's coming out of your, uh, applic of your uh, user. So normally when you go to Google and you just uh, you know, go to the Google homepage and type in something, and basically what, what you'll end up with is that you, you'll end up in a URL like this. So this is the, the normal search page for Google where you're searching for cat pics. And uh, so all you need to do in order to actually export to run a cross-site request forgery is create an iframe. Again, this is all you know, zero pixels, so you can't actually see it. But uh, in the background, it's loading this the same search query. So if you're looking at uh, at someone's cache or looking at stuff that's coming through a proxy, all you're going to see is this thing that looks very much like a normal normal Google search. And uh, and what, so what's going to happen is that Google search is going to end up in the cache. It's going to end up possibly in the browser history. It depends a little bit on what browser you're using and the circumstances. Um, in general. Um, Internet Explorer uh, iframes, at least, don't show up in your, in your history, but uh, for Firefox 2, they kind of do. They, they end up in the raw history.dat file, but they don't end up in the, in the history that you see if you do like a control H in Firefox to, to view the, the actual history of where you've been. So, um, so that's, uh, and then also in Firefox, one of the things that will happen is that um, the, the first search result from Google, uh, for, if you're running Firefox, is, is, has a special HTML um, attribute where it's prefetched. So basically the browser can go ahead and prefetch that link because most of the time when you run a search you're going to click on the first result. So it allows the, uh, the, the result to come back faster to the user. So in Firefox, you know, that, that's going to happen as well, that you're going to see things going out uh, not just to Google but to whatever that first link was. And, and also you're going you're gonna to see the, uh, the search history. So Google has this feature that if you have a, a Google account, like a Gmail account or something like that, you can enable their search history feature, which means that you're gonna, it's going to record every search that you ever do, and then you can, use, uh, you can go back later if you're like, well, I found something earlier today. I can't remember what I actually searched for. That's uh, what it's for. And, uh, and also Google, I'm, I'm sure, although I, I can't say for certain, well, I guess that's not a very good statement, is it? I'm 99% sure, although I can't say for certain because I'm not privy to their insider information, but I'm sure they have internal databases on all of us of everything we've ever searched for, and, uh, and that, that's going to be stored somewhere. That, that uh, you know, Whatever search query that, that happened kind of behind the scenes is going to get somehow tied back to you as a person, or at least back to some session identifier that's probably tieable back to you. And, uh, and so even if you don't have the search history feature on where you can actually see what they're storing, they're probably storing it somewhere. So let's go ahead and do a quick demo there. And uh, the demo here will just uh, basically start, start back at, a, at the page that we had before. I'll go ahead and clear it out. So let's go into our internet options. And let's go ahead and just delete everything in this. So let's, we're going to go ahead and delete our whole history and cache and everything. And then if you go, uh, go here to uh, view files, we'll see that it's actually empty um, wherever the uh, refresh is. Does that refresh? Sure. OK. So, so our cache is now empty. So let's go ahead and back into our web browser. Okay, we just got to close this stuff out. Go into our web browser and let's go to this other link that we had here. Okay, so so now we see, and you can see at the bottom there's some kind of weird stuff going on. And that uh, if you if you watched quickly, you would have seen that there was some uh, things going to Google. And we go back here and hit uh, F5 so they don't have to find it. And you'll see that there's actually things in your history. So. You'll see both uh, HTML pages and images and that sort of thing, the JPEGs. Because what, what actually is getting loaded in the background is this, uh, this web page here, which is the actual search query. And uh, so when we load that up, which uh, should take a minute, you'll see that th these are the images that actually appear in the cache, or these images here, along with this stuff. So that's just a simple uh, example of a CSRF that's causing things to happen on the browser that obviously the, the user has no, no, aware of, no, no awareness of. So let's go back to our slides, if I can remember which directions I need to point this thing in. OK, so that's, that's the end of our demos. Any questions at this point on what CSRFs are, why, why we uh, care about them, and, and how they work, those sorts of things, while well, I take a quick drink? <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so 
let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the scope of this. So we've shown a few examples, and let's see where we're at on time. It's uh, okay. We got about a, a half an hour left, which is good because I think we have a, a good amount of material we have to cover. The uh, so we've talked about a couple specific examples of CSRFs, and, and the Netflix example is a little bit of a, a strange one because most, most of the big web applications, you know, Gmail, uh, Yahoo, those sorts of sites have, have had CSRF issues in the past, but they've all been corrected. That they've, they're, you know, they're made aware of them and they go back and fix them. But, uh, but it's really kind of the, uh, the anomaly, I think, as far as our, our experience. So at Mandiant, we do uh, web application security assessments and those sorts of things. And, and we, we pretty much never see developers actively trying to prevent CSRF. What we see is that sometimes whatever framework they're using or, or uh, environment that they're running in happens to provide them protection from CSRF. But we, we basically never see uh, uh, developers actively trying to prevent them because I think it's just something that's just, it's just very pervasive in the, in the way that uh, the, develop, uh, the protocols work and the way that applications are developed. And it just hasn't really bubbled up to the top, I think, the way that cross-site scripting and SQL injection have. And some of these quotes are a little bit old, but I think they're in, in, in respect pretty much uh, the same sorts of things that we're seeing today. And that is you know, just what I just said, that you know, if, if you're not taking specific steps to remediate them, you're probably vulnerable. Although, like I said, this has changed a little bit because some frameworks are, are providing protections for you. And uh, this is something from, a, from 2006, but it's also interesting. I'm not gonna read all of these, you guys can read them, but uh, basically what I'm trying to get across here is that you know, CSRFs are, are all over the place, you know, that it's not something that's just uh, you know, kind of a, an outlier. I think it's uh, something that you're gonna see all over. And this is another quote from Jeremiah Grossman in, in 2006. Present in just about every website. And then the, even the OWASP top 10, so the OWASP, uh, the Open Web Application Security Project, released a new top 10 last year, and uh, they uh, included CSRF as one of the uh, issues there that it was not previously in the top 10, so that was uh, an addition. And it basically, it's, you know, they say, it's not new, you know, it's, CSRF has been known for quite a while, it's just that people really haven't talked about it too much and haven't been, uh, and it's, it's a little bit more complicated sometimes to test for than, uh, than uh, cross-site scripting or those sorts of issues. But, like it says, you know, the uh, top 10 says that the, it's widespread, everything's pretty much vulnerable to it. So now let's talk about, you know, now we've gotten to the point of, you know, hopefully you guys understand what the issue is and, uh, and, and what it is, uh, why it is that we're interested in it. So let's talk about, you know, how do, how do we detect or rule out CSRF during, a, uh, during an investigation? So but the, uh, the scenario at this point is you found someone who's, uh, who's done something bad, you know, that you, uh, he, he's gone to some site that he wasn't supposed to at work, for example. And, uh, and now we want to know, you know, was this something that he actively did? or is it something that perhaps was caused by a CSRF? So the first thing you can look for is look, look at the web browser cache. So the web browser cache is probably where you found at least some of the information of you know, the bad stuff that happened, but potentially you may also find the, the pages that, that caused the, the, the request as well, the, the, the basically the host that's hosting the CSRF may be in the cache. Now, it depends a little bit on where, the, where the, that uh, content is being stored. If the attacker has kind of a full website that he can go ahead and create uh, full HTML, then if he's smart anyway, he's probably flagged those pages as no cache if he's really trying to, to, to meddle with people. Um, and, and so that can be done either through, through meta tags in the HTML or through HTTP server headers. Um, if, if the uh, CSRF is hosted on like a wiki or a web forum or something like that, perhaps the attacker maybe didn't have the ability to set that. So it is still possible that you would see the, uh, the, uh, the actual page that forced the request in the cache. Um, but a couple, couple things you need to be aware of is that, uh, and we're gonna talk about those in a little bit more detail, is that um, you're not always gonna see the kind of simple examples that I just talked about, you know, where we just say, you know, iframe, you know, size is zero pixels, here's the, uh, here's the source, you know, link that you want to go grab. There's all sorts of different encodings that can be done in order to kind of obfuscate that content, which is uh, similar to, to, to what you see in cross-site scripting. Uh, so here's just a couple examples here where it's like the Google search page that we talked about earlier, um, you can just do URL encoding. So you can't URL encode the, uh, the actual server name or, or the, uh, the base URL, but the query parameters, both the, uh, the, uh, the, the basically the parameter names and then the parameter values can all be uh, URL encoded. So this, this uh, I believe here is the same, you know, cat fix search that we saw earlier, but it's uh, all URL encoded now. So just searching for cat picks in, in, uh, in the, in the uh, cache isn't necessarily gonna pick up what it is that, uh, that uh, caused the, uh, the CSRF. Um, you can also do some weird stuff with the host name. 
um, you know, where Google.com is, uh, at least this is one of the IPs for Google.com. So you could just have the IP address, that's kind of the standard format, but you can even have these other kind of strange formats that, uh, that are still supported by you know, modern browsers is kind of surprising because uh, you, know, you can have a D word, you can have these hex bytes, you can have uh, octal bytes. There's all sorts of ways that you can represent the host name in the URL. So those could be there as well. So you may not even see the google.com that you're looking for. Um, and, and this is the other thing to consider is that how, how the things may be obfuscated may affect how they show up in the cache or in the history as well. So that if you have uh, so if you see things like in your proxy logs that are coming out that are, uh, that are, that are looking like this, then, then potentially that's because someone has, has deliberately obfuscated them. But it kind of depends, I think, on your circumstances as far as the browser may unobfuscate this before it actually sends it out, or when it stores it in the cache, it may be unobfuscated. So it really kind of depends a little bit on the circumstances. And then the actual HTML tags can be encoded in all sorts of ways, and this is what I mentioned is similar to cross-site scripting in the sense of, you know, browsers are very lenient in how they interpret HTML because they want to they wanna allow people that have broken websites to have the sites actually still display, you know, that the users don't want it that when they go to a site it's going to just break. So, you know, you can have weird things like you can have, like, you know, for an iframe tag, for example, you may have some random text after the iframe that, that's still going to render as an iframe. You can have these, like, weird, like, uh, extra open uh, uh, brackets. Uh, you can have like these malformed image tags. You can have like uh, null bytes embedded in the middle of uh, the iframe tag. You can, and then the worst, one of the worst things you can see is actual JavaScript, where it's like you can take the whole of, of whatever it is you want and just use the JavaScript's you know, document.write method to write whatever you want. So in this case, we've just um, URL encoded the entire um, section that we want. So this would be basically uh, an image tag, I believe, or an iframe tag. That's, uh, that's going to be obfuscated. But it, you, can even, you could even do worse things where you could actually, uh, rather than just using URL encoding, you could actually encrypt them in, in various sorts of ways within JavaScript. There's, there's actually implementations of various encryption algorithms within JavaScript you could use. And uh, also, you know, so like I said, this is similar to cross-site scripting. So if you're uh, interested in that, you can go and read a whole bunch more at rsnake's uh, cross-site scripting uh, cheat sheet. So now that we've talked about how you, uh, how you look at the cache, let's, let's talk a little bit about the browser history. So browser history is, uh, is something that, uh, that may be interesting to you. Uh, you know, uh, in general, like I said, from, from the little testing that I did, most of the time, um, things that are forced by a CSRF are not going to appear in your browser history. And, and, and you wouldn't expect that they would, because normally images and that sort of thing uh, probably don't. Inline frames may or may not, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but I haven't tested everything. So there's all sorts of other ways that the CSRF could have happened that, that may or may not cause it to appear in the history. So you kind of need to maybe look into it a little bit more if it's something you're really concerned about. But the, uh, but the other thing is that just because something is in the cache and not on the, in the history doesn't mean that it was a CSRF. I mean, I think it's probably much more likely that either the history just, you know, the, the history in the cache age differently. So the history is generally set to a certain number of days that your browser history is stored, whereas your cache is set to a certain amount of disk space. So if you do a lot of web surfing, you could see how stuff would still be in the history that's not on the cache anymore, and vice versa. If you do very little web browsing, or at least browse to the same few sites that, that uh, you know, don't use the cache too much, then you would end up with where you have a lot of things in your uh, cache that aren't in the history anymore just because they're older than the history was. So, um, so that could be the case. And it also could be the case that the user has deliberately cleared the history, that you know, users may not fully understand that, you know, hey, I should probably clear both the history and the cache. Or it could be that the user did clear both the history and the cache, and you've been able to recover whatever it is that you're looking at through looking at deleted files or the unallocated space on the, on the disk or those sorts of things. So that's, uh, that's how that works out. So really the most fruitful way uh, to, that, that I've come up with to be able to look at this is really to construct a timeline. So what you want to do is you want to take all the data that you have. So you've got a, uh, you know, the, the browser cache as far as, you know, there's timestamps there on the cache as far as how, uh, when those things were downloaded. There's also you know, your browser history that will tell you when things uh, were visited in the history. And then you may have proxy logs or IDS logs or whatever the heck else you have. Put that stuff all together and basically build a timeline and say, you know, this is the beginning of it and this is the end. And then you say, well, basically, you know, we've got this, uh, this piece of illicit activity that, you know, this is, the, this is where he visited the website that we didn't want this person to go to. And let's, you know, what happened before that and what happened after that? And most importantly, what happened before it? You know, was he, was he uh, 
was it kind of at the beginning of a browsing session that like all this, you know, sudden, you know, hey, this thing just popped up. So well, that's probably a pretty good indication that a CSRF wasn't involved. But if he was maybe surfing to some other websites immediately beforehand, then maybe it's something that, uh, that one of those other sites did cause the, the activity. And you want to make sure you go back and look at those, you know. Have, uh, you know if, especially if you start seeing some of the weird stuff like we just talked about with the obfuscation, look at, the, uh, look at what's going on uh, in those sites to see if perhaps something, uh, something bad is going on. And, uh, and if, you don't have the, and if you don't have access to those sites because they're not in the cache, perhaps go and actually pull those, pull, pull those down again. If, you can, if you've got the URLs, perhaps you can get back to the data and see what's going on. So that's the most useful way I've really come up with to, to do this. There's a few other things you can do that, that are probably not going to work most of the time, but still useful to keep in mind. One is uh, Internet Explorer, at least, stores a list of URLs that are typed into the browser. So if you're concerned that, like, you know, hey, this guy was managing his eBay store on company time, then it, you know, it, it may, it's likely that the guy maybe actually just did go and type www.ebay.com into his browser, and now, uh, and so that would show up in the typed URL list that's in the in the registry for Internet Explorer. Um, that's I think a small percentage of sites are actually going to have that you know sort of issue where people actually typed in those the, the URL, and not all browsers are going to record it. But it's at least something to look for. It's a good way that if you see this, this is definitely a, a good indication that CSRF wasn't involved. <clears throat> the other thing is you know look at look at what's in their bookmarks or their favorites. You know that stuff can't be forced by CSRF. So obviously, if they've got eBay in their favorites, then then that's an indication that they're, they're visiting that site. But again, that's a small percentage, I think, of sites that people go to that they're going to, uh, that they're going to, I'm sorry, uh, small percentage of sites that they go to that they're going to bookmark. Sorry, I was just checking my time here. I think we're in pretty good shape. We have uh, basically 15, 20 minutes left. <clears throat> and, all, and the other thing would be to look for evidence that's outside of your web browser cache. So if you're interested in image files, of, of whatever sort that the, the person was, uh, was, was looking at, then look you know, not just what's in the cache, but if there's a directory full of image files that he's not supposed to have that's you know, somewhere else outside of the browser cache, then that's obviously something that uh, is interesting and, and is going to be a good indicator that you know, the guy was doing something he wasn't supposed to. So you know, obviously, that's only going to find stuff that the person saved, not just stuff that they surfed to. But it's something that definitely, if you see it, it's a, it's a good indication. So. The last thing you can do, and, and at least when you're looking at a traditional CSRF kind of issue. So we're looking at an issue where we have a uh, application that's, that's got some sort of state change. So if you look at a, I think you get about a web forum that we've got, you know, a post to a web forum that, that is attributed to this person, but the person says you didn't do it. So what you may want to do is look into the actual application itself and say, hey, is, that, is it vulnerable to CSRF? Is it something that we have uh, that the, it has that sort of uh, security flaw that it could have been a CSRF, or hopefully the, the application is not vulnerable, and then that way you can kind of rule that out right away. So, so the, again, this only works in, in kind of the traditional web application security sense. And if, you, if you're looking at you know, a CSRF that's only aiming to affect the, uh, the local browser history or cache, then you know, this isn't really going to help you. Um, so we're going to talk about that next. So, I'm going to pause right now and take another drink. And, and anyone, anyone have any other questions or anyone have any other ideas of like, hey, this is how we could do this? So go ahead. Um, well, it's different because cross-site scripting, the difference would be that <clears throat> the, the, the goal of cross-site scripting is for the attacker to get a JavaScript to run within the context of whatever application you're attacking. So for, if for in the Netflix example, that would be if there's some way that I could you know, construct a link that when you click on it would take you to Netflix and then feed you back some JavaScript that I control as the attacker, then that gives you all sorts of power above and beyond what cross-site request forgeries give you. Because once you've got cross-site scripting, you can basically you, you, you can take over the, uh, the victim. Because you can basically steal a session identifier and send it back to yourself. Or you could, even if they're doing some complicated session stuff, you can actually, there's a, a proxy that you can use. There's like a little JavaScript proxy called XSS proxy that allows you to basically take over the remote user's uh, environment. So I think it's, a, it's definitely cross-site scripting is a more significant issue. But it, I mean, it's a little bit the same because it does have the cross-site in the in the in the name and also in kind of the way it works. 
but I think in reality, it's, it's, they're different. So any other questions or comments at this point? Okay, so uh, let's get into kind of our last section here, which is just how to detect and prevent CSRF. So this, uh, for those of you who are, are maybe web application developers or, or penetration testers, this uh, maybe is interesting for you uh, if you haven't been interested in the rest of it. In that, uh, you know, because really what, what a CSRF is, there, there's the, the, when you're looking at it in a web application, is it an application is accepting data, uh, is accepting a request that caused something to happen. So there has to be a state change happening on the server. So generally, that's going to be in an HTTP POST request, although poorly designed applications may, uh, may use GETs in order to, uh, in order to cause state changes to happen. But generally, it's going to be in a, in a POST. And then the, uh, the key also is that you've got the ability for the attacker to figure out all of the parameters that need to be sent along with that post for another user. So typically what you'll have is, an, is a, you know, the attacker is also a user of the application. So he can log in and see, oh, okay, so if I'm going to submit, you know, a posting to this web forum, you know, this is how it looks. It's like basically there's, you know, probably in the post parameters there'll be like a title equals whatever, body equals whatever, you know, maybe some other parameters that, that go along with the post. But that's generally how, how things are going to happen. So the attacker is able to see, you know, this is how I send a post to the forum. And basically, if he's able to figure out, like, well, hey, here's how another user should submit a post, then it's going to be vulnerable to CSRF. So typically what's going to happen in a CSRF is that those parameters are the same for everybody. You know, in, in a web forum, it'll just be title body, that's it. Maybe it's, like, title body and then the sender is being sent as well. But if I know the sender's user ID, then I can make that all together as well. That's the... So, so the key is that, you know, the attacker can figure out the parameters for another user in order to be able to, to cause a CSRF. So there's a couple things just to be aware of that people sometimes suggest to prevent CSRF that doesn't really help. Um, referrer headers sometimes, sometimes can be helping in the sense of that you can eliminate some CSRFs by checking referrers, but you're not going to fix all of them because uh, different browsers behave differently as far as when they send referrer headers. Some browsers don't send them at all, or at least users turn them off. So um, if, if you're going to just uh, only, if you're going to rely on referrer headers, then you need to uh, rely, uh, you're going to perhaps isolate some users, and some users won't be able to use your application. Um, you can certainly use referrers that if it's a bad referrer header, you can use that to kind of eliminate some things that, uh, that, that would be cross-site request forgeries, but you're not going to be able to prevent all of them because a lot of times you're just not going to have a referrer header to go off of. Um, we talked several times about posts and gets. I mean, doing, doing a cross-site request forgery with a post is only a, a slightly bit harder than doing it with a get, and uh, so that doesn't really help you. Limiting the duration of sessions, we talked earlier about Netflix and how it provides, you know, these very long sessions and encourages you not to log out of the application. Uh, limiting the duration of sessions is going to reduce your window of exposure to CSRF, but it's not going to completely eliminate the problem because there's going to be a... Uh, you know, still that window that while the session is valid that they're going to, uh, it's going to be vulnerable. And, and some applications just aren't able to do that, you know, and it kind of makes sense for Netflix if they didn't have these CSRF problems anyway. But, you know, they want you to stay logged into the application because it's easier for the users and you're more likely to stay a subscriber with them and keep paying them money. So that makes sense. Um, so when you go to prevent CSRF, there's, there's a few things to know. One is that you cannot directly prevent it in the sense of there, you can't, as an application developer, or even, you know, uh, if you're a standards body and you want to just change the way HTTP works to not allow CSRF, it's just not going to work. It's just too ingrained in how the web works. So as an application developer, you've just got to accept that requests can be forced to you by um, a CSRF, that, you know, a user can, you know, requests that you're getting from a, that looks like to be coming from a particular user because of the session ID could actually be caused by a CSRF. So what you need to do is you need to, when those requests are coming in, if it's going to cause a state change. If it's not causing a state change, then you really don't care. But if it's going to cause a state change, you need to make sure, is that request legitimate or not? So you're still going to have to accept the request, but then you can decide if you're actually going to act on it or not when it comes in. So the key to that really is that you've got to have some additional parameters. So I mentioned earlier that the key to a CSRF is that you have the attacker is able to figure out all the parameters for some other user 
Well, the way you break it is you make it that one of those parameters is something that the user, the attacker, isn't going to know. So you uh, basically are going to implement that either as a hidden form field if you're if you're using a form submission, or you know uh, maybe in the action, which is actually like where the form submits to, basically in the URL line for the form submission. There's going to be some other sort of parameter that's not guessable by the attacker, and. Uh, and that's, uh, so that way the attacker is not able to construct a link or a script to actually execute the CSRF. And uh, the reason that works is that, you know, even though uh, it's, it's kind of the way that the, uh, the, the protocol is set up and that the, uh, even if you've got JavaScript that's causing the CSRF to happen, it can cause a request to happen to the remote server, but it can't access the, uh, the cookies from that remote server. So you're not able to maybe pull that data back out and put it into a form field or that sort of thing. And that's the, the same origin policy, basically, is what dictates that. So if I'm the attacker and I'm hosting JavaScript even, um, you're not allowed to, uh, I'm not allowed to, act, I can, cause requests to happen to other sites, but I can't access the response to those requests, and I can't access the, I can't access cookies or those sorts of things in JavaScript. So, uh, so I mentioned earlier, uh, or just a second ago anyway, about the session ID and your cookies, and that's one, uh, one option. So you can prevent uh, cross-site request forgeries by using your session ID as that kind of other parameter. And it's, uh, there's some issues with that. Um, you know, having your session ID and your URL is not always the best thing because it's going to show up in proxy logs and web server logs and those sorts of things. But it's, a, it's an easy way to make it happen. It's, it's a kind of a technique uh, that, uh, that you'll see people use. Uh, they call it double cookie submission. So it's basically your session ID is in your cookie and also in the URL parameter. So it's, it ends up in both places. And uh, so the other, the other option really is, is create another session ID. So basically you end up with two session identifiers for every user. And uh, one of them is always going to be in the, uh, the actual session ID. It, it, I'm sorry, one of them is going to be in a cookie that's stored persistently, and the other is going to be stored, uh, just only used in form fields in order to do uh, form submissions. And, uh, and there's some other, like, even fancier techniques you can do. Uh, you can actually take uh, the form parameters along with the session ID and, like, hash them together in order to create kind of a, a Mac or, or something like that. Uh, so there's, there's lots of different techniques, but the, this is kind of the easiest thing to do. As long as you've got the ability to, uh, to store that extra session ID, that's pretty much what you want to do. So I think we're, uh, we've got about five minutes left, which is good. So if, uh, if whatever questions you guys have, feel free to throw them out. I know I passed around an envelope earlier, so whoever has that, if you could bring it up to the front here. And then if anyone didn't get a chance to throw your business card or just throw your name on a piece of paper in here, go ahead and uh, you can come up and uh, do that now. Otherwise, we're going to... Give, it, give you guys a minute if you want to do anything or ask any questions or whatever, and then we'll, we'll draw a name here in a minute for the books. And uh, so go ahead, Eric. You mentioned earlier that some frameworks have built-in support for CSRF submission. Mm -hmm. So let's just say uh, Java.net, um, As far as I know, PHP doesn't have anything like that. Uh, there, there's probably some modules that you could use. Um, ASP.NET uh, 2.0 does have some support for it. I'm, I'm not entirely clear because... Uh, uh, I was actually just looking at an application yesterday that has those sorts of issues that, uh, that uh, because by default you have the view state that uh, that will kind of track where you're at in the application as you're kind of browsing around, um, but I believe that that's not normally tied back to the user session. So that there's a there's a feature you can enable. I think it's like uh, event. It's like uh, yeah, there's some sort of uh, thing that you have to enable, I believe, in order to add that. From from what I understand, but and then if you look at the Java side, I don't think that any of the Java frameworks that or I'm sorry, Java J2EE itself, I don't think has any of it. I'm not sure about like Struts or Spring, those sorts of frameworks. Some of those might have stuff built in. I know that OWASP, if you if you're a J2EE developer, OWASP has their CSRF guard that they built. Uh, it's a Java basically servlet filter that you can use to to basically automatically add CSRF protections into your application. So, other questions? So, while I'm getting blank stares here, I'm going to go ahead and pull someone's name out of this thing. Let's see here. Alex Augustin? Is he still here? Okay. So, you can, uh, you can grab yourself a couple books here. And then, uh, if, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up and, and talk to me afterwards, or I'll be over in the little speaker lounge area. And uh, thank you much for coming. <laughs>